Today's episode is brought to you by Endel. When we think of angels, it's easy to imagine them as winged beings that are glorious and pure. From gilded armors to perfect faces, the concept of the angel has transcended through generations and has gone on to become the inspiration for art and literature, where the angel is featured as an immaculate human with wings and a pinnacle of all that is righteous. Even today, many people place a significant amount of importance upon the angels of God, those who, to some, are the conduits by which their prayers will be met. They are, for the most part, benign beings that bring about warmth, comfort, and safety, and while descriptions of them do vary, seldom are they reported as wicked or scary. This contradicts one idea from the Bible, where characters who are descended upon by angels are normally struck with both distress and horror, to the point that they are unable to even stand. You'll notice that frequently, when angels make their presence known in the Bible, they tell those who are listening not to be afraid, providing us with an idea that the real angels are quite hard to digest. We see this in Isaiah's account when he finds himself in the hall of the seraphim, angels who were considered to be six-winged creatures that represented fire. Unable to cope with their sheer presence and the holiness about them, Isaiah becomes stricken and panics that he is damned, for he was not dressed properly for such an occasion. The seraphim though inadvertently struck the fear of God into Isaiah, and whilst they prove to be helpful and forgiving, they are not creatures that he feels particularly at ease with. The same could be said for Ezekiel, who discovered the cherubim, where he described them as possessing four heads, one of a human, one of an ox, one of an eagle, and one of a lion. But perhaps one of the most strangest and downright weirdest creatures that are thought to exist within scripture are the Ophanim, those that are believed by some to be just a mechanism of God's chariot and by others to be angelic beings with significant powers. The reason why they are called Ophanim is because in ancient Hebraic, the word Ophanim was thought to have meant wheels. It was also believed that the word could be spelled as Orphanim or Ophanim, as well as a third variation as Galgalim. In other beliefs, Ophanim are also described as spheres or whirlwinds or again the very wheels that were attached to the chariot of God. And the reason for all three of these ideas can likely be pinpointed in the visions seen by Ezekiel. Before we dive into the meat and bones of today's episode, I'd like to talk to you about the sponsor of today's video, Endel. If you're anything like me, chances are you have trouble getting to sleep or that your sleep quality isn't that great. Other times you might lack mental clarity, or just might be struggling to be productive at all. Worst case, you suffer from anxiety, and are prone to stressing out. Sound familiar? I know the feeling quite well. Having tried Endel, however, I found that not only has the quality of my sleep improved, in that I'm not waking up every five minutes, but also, I've been able to get more done. But what is Endel, and how does it work? Endel is an environment-based non-profit app that produces real-time personalized soundscapes that help you relax, focus, or just fall asleep. Based on the time of day, your location, heart rate, or even the weather, Endel can produce sounds that not only complement your world, but also reduce stress, calm nerves, improve focus, and lull you into a state of slumber. It's also great for helping you sneak in a power nap here and there. Just load up the app, select your requirement from the pre-made options, and Endel will do the rest. The first 100 people to download Endel using the link in the description below will get a free week of audio experiences. And now back to Ezekiel and his encounter with the opening. It was thought to be sometime in the Neo-Babylonian period when Ezekiel and 10,000 Jews were captured by the Babylonians and brought to a village named Tel Aviv. 
During this time, Ezekiel finds himself one day by the river Chabar, and he is approached by God, who supplies him with what is known as the inaugural vision. The vision consists of some pretty wild and extraordinary things, but as far as the cherubim and the ophanim go, Ezekiel tells us, As I looked at the living creatures, I saw a wheel on the ground beside each creature, with its four faces. This was the appearance and structure of the wheels. They sparkled like topaz, and all four looked alike. Each appeared to be made like a wheel intersecting a wheel. As they moved, they would go in any one of the four directions the creatures were faced. The wheels did not change direction as the creatures went. Their rims were high and awesome and all four rims were full of eyes all around. The living creatures that Ezekiel sees here are indeed the cherubim, as he confirms in the prior passage, but he spends an equal amount of time taking in the sight of these four wheels, these ophanim. He describes them as glistening like topaz, and that all four assembled to make the shape of one wheel intersecting another. He also adds that whilst they appeared independently mobile, they only moved wherever the cherubim were facing, which has since led some to believe that the cherubs controlled the ophanim, or was a symbol for their outranking of them. He continues to state that they do not appear to ever change their direction, and that all the rims of their being were covered with eyes. But of this passage alone, it only raises our intrigue as to what these wheels were, and what exactly their function was. Ezekiel is able to paint a somewhat vivid picture of what these wheels look like, but perhaps what makes them so stark and fascinating is how elusive they are. The wheels are not something that appear frequently throughout the Bible, and the fact that God allows Ezekiel to see them only teases the idea that they do have some significance that we are not grasping. One interesting idea that further supports the notion that these wheels were the wheels of God's chariot comes from a song of praise by David in Psalm 18, where we are told, He mounted the cherubim and flew. He soared on the wings of the wind. In this rather unique imagery, it could be said that cherubim had a more practical function as they served as God's vehicle, or a means for which to transport him across the sky, or from heaven to earth. The cherubim in this instance become the chariot, and by this, the wheels that they are seen to manipulate become the wheels of that very chariot. But Ezekiel does not make this connection, but is instead taken aback by what he continues to witness. He tells us, When the living creatures moved, the wheels beside them moved, and when the living creatures rose from the ground, the wheels also rose. Wherever the spirit would go, they would go, and the wheels would rise along with them, because the spirit of the living creatures was in the wheels. When the creatures moved, they also moved. When the creatures stood still, they also stood still. And when the creatures rose from the ground, the wheels rose along with them, because the spirit of the living creatures was in the wheels. Here he essentially confirms the idea that the wheels were controlled by the cherubim, and that they did indeed have some power over these elements, and that wherever the cherubim went, the ophanim would go too. He also adds that the very spirit of the cherubim exists within the ophanim, suggesting that on some level, perhaps these strange creatures are extensions of the angels, as opposed to being angels themselves. Touching once again upon the chariot idea, as hinted by the Song of David in Psalm 18, one might also say that the cherubim were the drivers of the chariot, and the wheels were merely just that. Wheels. With this idea, they are not angelic, and they do not have sentinels, but instead are more along the lines of machinery. Yet the idea that the Ophanim were indeed angels, perhaps the weirdest of angels given their appearance, remains to be consistent within some communities and traditions. We can agree from Ezekiel's account that despite their association with the cherubim, there is nothing particularly angelic about the Ophanim. They do not appear to have human characteristics, like all the other angels, 
they do not speak and bring prophecies, and they do not appear to even have wings. Reference of them is made in the second book of Enoch, where we see Enoch ascend before the throne of God. He tells us, I saw there a very great light, and fiery troops of great archangels, incorporeal forces, and dominions, orders, and governments, cherubim and seraphim, thrones and many-eyed ones, nine regiments, the Ionic stations of light, and I became afraid, and began to tremble with great terror. And those men took me, and led me after them, and said to me, Have courage, Enoch, do not fear, and showed me the Lord from afar, sitting on his very high throne. Whilst again not specifically mentioned as Ophanim, Enoch does refer to them as the many-eyed ones, which correlates with Ezekiel's description. What's interesting here is that he later identifies all the present entities, including the cherubim, seraphim, and these many-eyed ones, as being men, and that these men took him and led him to the throne of God, where they reassured him that he was safe. Whilst hard to say, given that Enoch does not determine these many-eyed ones to be the Ophanim, it could be said that in this story, the many-eyed ones did maintain some characteristics of men, and that instead of wheels, they possessed a more expected and relatable form. They also share the same compassion as the cherubim and the seraphim, and seek to comfort Enoch when he would otherwise panic, thus suggesting another layer of benignity to these otherwise misunderstood creatures. The second book of Enoch continues to tell us of the many-eyed ones, that, and the cherubim and seraphim standing about the throne, the six-winged and many-eyed ones do not depart, standing before the Lord's face, doing his will, and cover his whole throne, singing with gentle voices before the Lord's face, holy, 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 Lord Ruler of Sabbath, heavens and earth are full of your glory. Here we get a sense that the many-eyed ones guard the throne of heaven, and along with the cherubim and seraphim, they will remain here for eternity at the beck and call of God. It is also established that they sing with gentle voices, which yet again humanizes the many-eyed ones and portrays them as more relatable perhaps even as a charming set of characters. With the many-eyed ones singing, it could also be associated with several Jewish prayers known as the Kedusha, where the Ophanim are told to offer praise upon God and glorify him as their creator. Whilst the second book of Enoch refers to them as the many-eyed ones, the first book of Enoch refers to them directly as Ophanim, and they are said here to also guard the throne of heaven and that together, with the seraphim and the cherubim, they do not sleep. Enoch tells us here, And round about were seraphim, cherubim, and ophanim, and these are they who sleep not, and guard the throne of his glory. There appears to be some variation in these angels, when it comes to both their ranking and their closeness to God. Most commonly in Jewish expositions of angelic hierarchy, the significance and purpose of the cherubim, seraphim, and the ophanim seldom seem to coincide across all traditions. To some, the cherubim are the closest to God, and as mentioned before, they are his chariot. More significantly, they are much more prominent in the Bible, and actually appear to Ezekiel, thus giving them the edge, at least in terms of recognition. The seraphim by comparison are also seen in a variety of ways, including as a caretaker to God's throne. And as the Bible shows us in Isaiah's vision, the seraphim can be viewed as absolvers of guilt. To more conservative Judaism though, the seraphim are more symbolic in nature. These inconsistencies, if you will, are the same for the ophanim in Jewish beliefs with some believing them to be the closest of all angels to God, as told to us by medieval Jewish philosopher Maimonides, or as the Thrones, another classification of angels. Many other Jewish philosophies confirm this idea, that the Thrones and the Ophanim are one in the same, and one of the ways that this is done 
is by one interpretation of Daniel's vision, where Daniel tells us he sees God in his chariot. He states, As I looked, thrones were set in place, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His clothing was as white as snow, the hair of his head was white like wool, his throne was flaming with fire, and its wheels were all ablaze. With this idea, the thrones become established as the wheels of God's vehicle, and are set in place before he takes his seat upon it. A quote from American spirituality writer Rosemary Ellen Greeley sums up the notion of the thrones and the Ophanim being the same quite concisely, where we are told, The thrones, also known as Ophanim and Galgalim, are creatures that function as the actual chariots of God, driven by the cherubs. They are characterized by peace and submission. God rests upon them. Thrones are depicted as great wheels containing many eyes, and reside in the area of the cosmos, where material form begins to take shape. They chant glorious to God, and remain forever in his presence. They mete out divine justice and maintain the cosmic harmony of all universal laws. As we can see, going by this interpretation, the thrones, or the Ophanim, lose their more typical angel appearance, and again resume the more biblically accurate description as a mechanism. In any case, one might say that the function of the Ophanim, whilst intriguing and novel, is not essential to believers, which is why concrete information about them is so scarce. Whether it be from characters of the Bible themselves, or scholars who studied them, the wheels are not only vital in their accordance to God. They serve to remind believers that their mystique and uncanny form is just one of the many creations that God has made that man cannot understand, and in some cases, it might serve to humble believers into realizing that they do not have all the answers. It also brings God's engineering or ingenuity into the limelight, for whilst many may take for granted the way in which the world was created, elements like the Ophanim remind them of how much of a mechanical mastermind a supreme being like God must be, especially given that we to this day would not be able to create something so unusual. Others might see the Ophanim as representations of God himself, in that because they are covered with eyes, the eyes become symbolic of God being all-seeing. If the Ophanim have a multitude of eyes, and spin omnidirectionally, then it would be believed that they can see everything from every angle. This would imply then that God could very well do the same, as we know he can from very specific mentions in the Bible that God is everywhere and knows everything. Whether or not the Ophanim are actually angelic beings, or simply a mechanism that allows for multidimensional travel, may not necessarily be so significant in the grand scheme of things, given that their role appears to be more useful to God than to mortals. Notice how in both Ezekiel and Daniel's account, they only see these wheels, but the wheels don't seem to have much of an impact on them, nor do they seem to be of any real merit to either character, beyond their fascinating design. But do let me know your thoughts and ideas on the Ophanim in the comments below, and as always, if you've enjoyed today's episode, then don't forget to give it a thumbs up, and don't forget to subscribe for more content just like this. Until next time.